Our first song, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. So why don't we do that? Thank you. 
all about you, Jesus. And we want to bless your heart this morning, Lord, as we worship and praise you. Why don't you say hello to somebody?
Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? So we've got some announce announcements this morning, so I'm just going to jump right into what's going on this week. Um, Ladies' Christmas event, please join us for a festive afternoon to celebrate Christmas together, Saturday at the church, December 16th, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Bring a plate of your favorite Christmas goodies to share and a wrapped ornament if you would like to participate in the ornament exchange. Sign up in the entryway at the women's ministry table. Um, directory questionnaire, there's a green sheet in the entryway. Please take one and fill it out if you have not done so or if you need to update any information. This is how we know where to send your Christmas cards, birthday cards, thank you cards, um, all throughout the year. Put it on Kathy's desk or give it to the office. Upcoming events, um, men's breakfast, um, December 9th at 8 a.m. February 23rd through 25th is the men's retreat in Boulder Creek, California. The theme is simply Jesus. Good facilities, speakers, food, and fun. Sign up with Brother Beans. Men's Bible study. Come to the Men's Bible study Tuesday at 7 p.m. You will be amazed. Volunteers needed for the bulletin board decorations. There's a, there's a bulletin board in the back near the, the bathrooms that gets decorated every month. So if you're able to volunteer for that, you, can, you could pick your favorite month and, and sign up on the, on the clipboard next to the bulletin board. And also, we are looking for somebody who can come in any time um, that we are in the office to straighten and refill the tithing envelopes and the blue connection cards on the back of the chairs in the sanctuary. Please let Kathy know if you are able to do this. Northern California Winter Camp for the Youth is coming. Mark your calendars for January 26th through 28th. Um, it'll be at Woodleaf Camp, and the cost is $155. Union Gospel Mission. We support the Union Gospel Mission every year by taking in items that they request. If you can donate anything from the following list, it will be greatly appreciated by the mission this holiday season. Those items are socks, t-shirts, fall or winter clothes, shoes, pajamas, coats, purses, tote bags, sleeping bags, mats, blankets, wheeled carts, and bicycles. Uh, please silence your cell phones and just want to remind everyone that there's no food or drinks in the sanctuary. Now we're going to do the, the tithes and offerings. Dear Lord, um, we, we bring these tithes to you and just as a demonstration of our faith that you are providing for us in every way. So um, please help us to recognize your, your presence in our lives and your, your um, provision for us, Lord. And, we just want to give back now and, and bless others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together, amen? Amen. I'm looking forward to what the Lord has for us today. We're going to continue worshiping him by reading his word. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lead not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as the Father, the Son, in whom he delights. Thank you, Lord, for your word. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Let's be people who truly acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways. Not some of our ways, but in all of our ways. And if there's any way in us that's not pleasing to you, Lord, let, it, let your Holy Spirit do the work of taking it away today. Amen? Let's, let's celebrate what Jesus has done for us, continuing to worship together.
thank you for this time of year, time to celebrate you and the birth of you, Jesus. While the rest of the world is singing Christmas songs with Santa Claus, Lord, we just want to sing songs about you. Mm-hmm. And Lord, we just lift you up today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was here for cleanup yesterday. For those of us that were here, (laughs) thank you so much. If you see people like walking around kind of funny, they were probably here. Yeah, it was great though. A lot of dirt came out of the building. Carpets cleaned, chairs scrubbed, tables scrubbed. Clorox on the walls and the bathrooms, all kinds of good stuff happening. Praise God. It's nice to have a clean church, amen? Nice to have a clean life, the Christian life. Thanks to Jesus, we're able to do so. We're able to be washed clean. Later on, we're going to have communion, a time where we symbolically partake of the elements that wash us clean, amen? Let's pray. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 14. Christ in us is the title. Christ in us. Oh, one more thing. Tithing. Thank you for, for tithing. Thank you for giving. And examples came in this week. We have a guy in Syracuse, New York, who came to church about 15 years ago, has been tithing ever since. He left probably 15 years ago. And David, if you're out there, David, live streaming, thank you. And and the guy, we get a check for, like, I know it's tithe because it's like 8764. You know, it's an odd number. If you were just giving, it would kind of probably be 10 or 50 or whatever. And then we have another family, can't come to church, hasn't been able to come for years. And $10 every week by some kind of pay form, you know, automatic pay, and you think $10 a week, well, at the end of the year, that's $520. Incredible, awesome. Just touched my heart to see these different offering and giving and hearts of generosity. Thank you so much. 2 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 14, Christ in us. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand, we'll get a Bible over to you. Let's pray. Father, we ask by your power that you would be our teacher and we would be your student. And we would come to love you more as we gather together in fellowship with you. And as we come to the end of this great epistle, Lord, 2 Corinthians, may we leave these studies stronger people than when we began, greater in the faith, greater in the fruits of the Spirit. And may your word surge out of us into our community. Father, increase our interaction with Jesus. And above all, may we leave closer to you, Almighty God. Amen. Can someone go in my office and grab my glasses off the desk? Paul is ending this letter to the Corinthians with a very different tone than he started with. In the first 10 chapters, nine chapters, 10 chapters, he had more of a flavor of a father who is being gentle, kind, and instructing his children. And then when you come to 10 through 13, he's now a father figure giving them more of a tough love type of deal. Thanks, Randy. As he nears the end of the epistle. And he basically has been asking and will pointedly ask in this passage, 2 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 14, he's asking them, Do you have Christ in you? And hence the title, Christ in us. Very important point, having Christ in us. 
different than all the other religions on earth, having Christ in us. And now he's going to ask them, does Jesus live in you? Does Jesus live in us? Because he's been accused of not having Jesus in him. And you see, we can talk about a certain city. I can talk about Paris, France. I've been there. I can talk about its population, its architecture, its geography, its restaurants and the food of Paris, the landmarks, the Eiffel Tower, the arch, different landmarks, the traffic patterns, all kinds of demographics without ever being there. Yes, I've been there, but I can talk about a city that I haven't been to, Singapore, and I can tell you many of those same things, restaurants, because I've watched these travel programs, because people have come back from Singapore and told me about the incredible architecture, and I've seen it on TV or the internet. I can do that. The demographics, Singapore is a very crowded place many, many people, without ever being there, I can tell you about these things. And having the ability to quote Bible verses doesn't mean that God's work is happening in your life. It doesn't mean that God's word is at work in your life because you can quote Bible verses or you can tell about Paul or you can tell about whoever, Isaiah, whoever, Moses, Noah, and it's necessary that we know him, not just know about him, but that we know him. Amen? Is that right? Why? Because one day we are going to die. Each and every one of us, one day, is going to make the transition from earth to heaven. And on that day, we're going to end up in one of two places, period. We're going to end up in heaven or we're going to end up in hell. Bottom line. Now, we can have age-old debates over Calvinism and Armenian, Armenianism. Is it the elect, the chosen by God, predestined before the foundation of the earth that will either be in heaven or hell, depending on how God cho chose before we were even born, before the earth was formed? Or is salvation an opportunity for all, every single individual in the world? We can argue these points. For me personally, Calvinism, Armenianism, well, personally, you know what? They get you to the same place. I'm saved. Whether I elected to choose and God chose because of those or whether God chose me, I don't exactly completely know. Or is it because anyone can be saved? And that's probably a more likely scenario for me, that anyone could be saved. <laughs> because why would God have chosen me in the state that I was in at the time that I got saved? But what I do know is it's not a mystery to me. After I was born again, I have never for one day or minute or second wondered if I'm saved. Never. The day... I'm not sure of whether I'm saved or not. It's the day that I need to step down from preaching. The guy who's up here shouldn't be a guy who's wondering if he's saved or not. Amen? Does that make the guy up here better? No. It just makes him someone that knows that he knows that he knows that God came into his life and God resides in him. Amen? It's the way it is. You see, you can be theologically right and be dead wrong. You can be theologically right and knowing all about it and be dead inside and not have the Lord inside of you. You can be theologically brilliant and not have Jesus in you. Cults and different religions do all they can to have their gods with them. They don't say there's no God. To this day, if you take a trip to, on a biblical trip, to Greece, to the city of Corinth, and you indeed, if you go to Greece, you'll go to Corinth. Well, to this day in Corinth, you can buy, Corinth, Greece, you can buy idols to Diana, Titan, 
Zeus, Athena, to all those different gods and goddesses. In ancient times, they would wear the idol of their god of choice around their necks. It would be a little image of, of Diana, an image of Zeus around their necks. And people would say, looking and seeing an image of Diana, oh, there goes someone who believes in Diana, a believer in Diana. But the Bible tells us the Lord wants to live in us, within us, not an idol around our neck. Not to say it's wrong to have reminders. You can have a cross. You know, you can even have a face of Jesus. I mean, you know, let's not be legalistic, but if you're kissing that, I, that pendant every night, then you're getting a little weird. You're getting a little out of balance. Amen? When you should be kissing the Lord. How do you kiss the Lord? Huh? Prayer? What else? Worship. Yeah, you can kiss the Lord every night. Worship it means kissing. Sending a kiss up to heaven. Wearing a cross does not make us a Christian. Christianity comes down from heaven. It's not because of what we wear around our neck. Christianity is something that is alive within us. It's not made of stone or wood or anything else or metal. Jesus says he wants to dwell within us. Within us. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. Amen? Religion is man's attempt to reach up to God. Christianity is God coming down to man. That's the songs we sang, the nativity scene. It's all about God coming from heaven down to earth to be with us. And we need to have that in our society, in our culture, in our world, in our life. Forget society, forget culture. I'm just enough myself, by myself, to need him within me, to survive, to flourish, to have some sense of joy in the midst of what's going on, east, west, north, and south, and all around us. Amen? That's the truth of it. God says, I want to make you my temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. You and you and you, young and old. That's what God says. Now, I remember growing up, and I'll give you a hint as to what religion I grew up in. We had a plastic figurine on the dashboard. Who was it? Well, Christopher's a good one, St. Christopher, but it was Mother Mary. Mother Mary was a common one also. And I remember to this day riding in the car. And I, I don't know if they had metal, it had a metal dashboard and it, magnetic or if there was some kind of a stick on deal. There was no, no what in that day. No Velcro. Velcro had not been invented back then. And I remember looking at that statue. My mother was driving. I'm sitting in the front seat and I'm looking at that statue, looking at me. And I'm saying, well, wait a second here. Mom, why do we have that figurine? Oh, for protection, so that on our trip everything will go well, so that we won't crash, that you know, the hazards of the road won't happen to us. And I go, okay. But then I'm thinking, well, why is she looking at me? She should be looking out the window at the street. Watch the road. Yeah, get your eyes on the road, Mother Mary. I don't want to crash. Look out for us. I wanted her to be turned around. This made sense to me. Well, back in the day of Paul, the ancient ships had figurines. They had figureheads looking out ahead. You know, the carvings in the bow, right? We've all seen pictures of them. In fact, Paul... In the book of Acts, said that he was on a ship that had the twin sons of the Greek god Zeus carvings in the front. 
What chapter was that? Oh, Jim Kirby's not here. It was in the book of Acts, chapter, Jim, 28. Thank you, Professor. Oh, by the way, let's pray for Jim. Lord, Jim and his family are traveling uh, for, for a week plus, and we've asked protection. And also, uh, Carla and June have asked that we pray for them. They're in the Philippines, and we ask you, Lord, to protect them while they travel. Amen. Now, it was thought that these figureheads on the ships would be some sort of divine GPS taking the place of our GPS, that it would get you there, that you wouldn't hit a reef, that you wouldn't sink, that you would get to your destination, to the port of choice. And these figurines somehow would protect you along the way. They would make the journey a safe journey and a journey where you arrived where you wanted to go like a GPS. Well, we don't need figureheads. We have a God that lives within us. And that's the amazing thing about Christianity. Our God has come to reside inside of us. Listen to this. John chapter 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. He's being out for up front. No, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, no matter what else is going on, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Who's speaking here? Yeah, not John. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus went away so the Holy Spirit could live in us. Now listen to this, John 14, verses 16 through 18. John 14, verses 16 through 18. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, who, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he, what? Dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. No. Abide with you forever. Amazing, is it not? I will not leave you orphans. Isn't that incredible that God has this investment in us, that God has this love for us, that God sees us as his children, never to abandon us, never to leave us without a father? Some of us grew up without fathers. But there was a father there all the time. Our Father who art in heaven. Isn't that so? And Christ within us. John 14, 16 through 18. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you forever. Forever. Now verse 1 of chapter 13 here in 2 Corinthians. This is Paul, the apostle, speaking now. This will be the third time I am coming to you. The third time. He's been there how many times? Twice. Two. Yeah. And now he quotes Deuteronomy. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be, what? Established. The word needs to be established. If the word just falls on our ears and it doesn't take root, it's not established. I have told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time. He's saying, it's, it's as if I was, I was, I'm with you right now. And now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before. It's not just that they're sinning now. They've, they've continually been sinning. And to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, we've talked about this, it's been ongoing, this questioning of Paul, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him. This is Jesus he's talking about. But we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. 
examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Now, who is he speaking to? Is he talking to the world? No. He's talking to the church at Corinth and every other church that existed then and ever since. And he's saying to the believers, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Now, is he being sarcastic? No, this isn't sarcasm. Test yourselves. Interesting. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you are disqualified. Now, this is some heavy stuff. Examine yourselves. Test yourselves. Find out, where's your walk at? Find out, do I know that Jesus is in me? Do I believe this? Do I know this? But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Now, Paul's personal here. He's saying, hey, you know what? We're not disqualified. Myself, Paul speaking, and those around me, we are not disqualified. We're not disqualified from ministry. We're not disqualified from being apostles from being leaders and whatnot, because we know Christ is in us. And I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Now I pray to God that you do not do evil, that you do no evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable. Though we may seem disqualified, because they think of him as being disqualified, for we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. So jot this down, note takers. When he says, examine yourself as a Christian, you should be able with the same understanding as Paul in boldness of fact, knowing it to be truth. You should be able to provide, to pull up some truth from within yourself that Christ is not just tied around your neck but that you are tied to Christ and that Christ resides in you. It's all important. Paul is saying, don't just assume this. I personally have known people personally, not secondhand info. I've even known a pastor or two personally, not hearsay. One pastor I know I can remember, but I believe there's been at least another, who told me they spent 20 years in the pulpit and were not born again. Yeah. It can happen. They didn't know. The guy thought he was born again. He wasn't a Calvary Chapel pastor. But he wasn't. And then when he did get born again, he realized, well, it's like, you know, it's like people who are totally depressed, totally depressed, and they've tried everything. They've had prayer. They've had people casting demons out of them of depression and all kinds of stuff. And then they go to the doctor, and the doctor says, try these anti-anxiety anti -anxiety medication. They take that, and the next thing you know, it's like a light goes on. They go, oh, yeah, I remember 45 years ago I used to feel like this when I was, you know, when I was 12 years old. I used to feel this good. And then their brain kind of clicks in, and then hopefully the plan is that before long you're able to rethink that, remember that, or maybe it's not. Some people don't, can't even remember ever being joyful or whatever. But then, and then they can get off the medications, and they still have that, that you know, not crazy up, but just, hey, a, a decent outlook and optimism and whatnot about life. Well, Paul's saying, don't just assume Christ is in you. Pastor, congregant, and rather than kissing the trinket that's tied around your neck, know the fact that Christ is in you, that you're tied to Christ, that he owns you. Don't assume it. Know that. Is Jesus in you? Well, if he is, you'll see the power in verses 1 through 4 that he's in you. Number one, 
if it's true that he's in you, first of all, there's going to be a power to engage. To engage people with your faith. To share your faith. That's what he's doing here. And it goes deeper than just sharing your faith. He says, this will be the third time I am coming to you. And by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. A biblical law, truth, and mild rebuke. That's what this is to them. I have told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time and now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest that if I come again, I will not spare. He's engaging. He's going to come to them. And by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. He goes Old Testament. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity. This is Deuteronomy 19, 15. Or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. We need this today. Someone will say something against someone on the internet, and the next thing you know, the world takes it as Bible truth, gospel truth, a character assassination. On the internet is like a death sentence. And there's no recourse, there's no defense. And don't forget, people love to believe a lie more than they love to believe the truth. They love it. That's why these news programs on TV are so successful because they'll tell, like, they'll twist things and whatnot into these conspiracy theories, all these different things that people, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I like CNN. Not regular CNN, but now they've got this new thing, News Without Politics. Of course, there's not much news, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's a lot. And it, it, it's an upbeat. It's not this, you know, this every day. <sighs> now, the Bible demands, Christians, you have to listen to eyewitnesses and a number of them before you make accusations against each other or anyone else for that matter. The Bible demands it. Jesus demands it. But how often do we go to someone else and say, oh, that person did this or that, without ever having gone to that person? It's sin to do that. You're to have two or three witnesses before you go and talk to someone else about someone. Amen? One person. Christians... You have to listen to eyewitnesses and a number of them before you believe what you hear. He says to them, I'm coming to you. He's setting this up. You Corinthians have crit criticized me. You've attacked me. You've undermined the ministry I've presented to you. You've done all these things. You've doubted my calling in God. You've doubted that I even believe in God, that I'm a Christian. Well, when I come and I will... I'm going to bring the word of God. And I'm going to produce overwhelming witnesses as well. Lest we forget, they met Jesus through who? Paul. That's how they became Christians. Paul came the first trip, the second trip, laid out the gospel, gave invitations, and they became Christians. These same ones who have turned on him now. And so he will come. And he'll go to the word of God in Deuteronomy. And lest we forget, they met Jesus through Paul, who years earlier had brought the gospel to him. And now they turn on him. They stick that knife in. And he's going to use this against them, or I should say for them, this two or three witness deal. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from, two or except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning do what? Rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may also fear. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 15. 
Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Number one, established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Don't blab it or post it, but take it to the church leadership. But if, we, if, he, if he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, it doesn't mean that they're working for the IRS. It means you treat them as if they were or are. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of that. Number one, regarding our engagements, regarding of the health of the truth, God's power is in us to engage. We have that power. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. Go to him and tell him alone. If someone hurts your feelings, what do we have going on here? If someone hurts you, we have an echo. Can you hear the echo? Or is, if someone hurts your feelings, has anyone in the church ever hurt your feelings? Be real. Yeah. All the time. Well, tell them. Otherwise, they don't even know. And if they don't know, that's not fair. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to them. You know, you're going around all hurt. Oh, I mean, they've done this to me. Oh, I'm hurt. But you don't let them know about it. And so they just repeat it. They do it again. Why not? They're clueless. That's Matthew 18. That's what it's designed for, is to stop this stuff. Otherwise, the devil comes in, and next thing you know, people, we've had people, you know, numerous people. Hey, oh, this person, they offended me, so I, I can't come to church on Sunday anymore. I'll watch live stream. Not Christian. Where two or three are gathered together, I'm in the midst of them. Now, this is one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. We often say, oh, here we are, one or two or three together, two or three together, gathered in prayer. Now we have a church. Now we can pray. But this Old Testament, New Testament verse is all about church discipline. Now, I'll tell you, now in this day and age, there's a lot of churches that have a lot of people, and if they started using this verse in church with the people, they wouldn't have so many people. People don't even like accountability in the message, never mind the one-on-one -on -one going to them alone and telling them in love and humility hey, you know, this is what you're doing. You shouldn't be living with that person if you're not married. You shouldn't be stealing at work. You shouldn't be this or that. Well, the next thing you know, they're all upset. But this verse is a verse Jesus uses in explaining it's an engagement, but in explaining the workings of church discipline. Jesus says when you're going to exercise church discipline, do it biblically. And I guarantee you, if you do it biblically, I will be in the middle of the activity involving church discipline. Meaning, Jesus is the pastor of the church. Jesus is the pastor of this church. Read the fine print. I'm the sheepdog. He's the shepherd. Regarding our operations, he's in our midst. We're to be engaged in loving each other, in hugging each other. And sometimes brothers and sisters need to come along and need to tell the truth in love. Hey, I'm here alone. I haven't told anybody about it. I'm praying about it. I've prayed about it. But we need to talk. The world has gone nuts. And Jesus may be returning at any time, and I need to talk to you, brother or sister. I need to tell you about this before he returns so that you know. Okay, so first the power has been given to engage. Secondly, the power has been given to establish the truth. Christ speaking in me. 
who, by the way, Paul tells them, is not weak toward you, but strong. Since, verse 3, you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you, for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. Now, what is Paul saying? Crucified in weakness. Well, get this picture in your head. The world looking at the cross and seeing Jesus crucified on the cross, the world doesn't think that this is like something that Almighty God is on his throne ruling the world. The world sees it as a man who was taken and beaten, mocked, crucified, and finally put to death on a cross of all things, a shameful place, and was out, was out of control. Was out of control. He, he wasn't out of control, but he wasn't in control. He wasn't controlling the scenario. That's how the world thinks of the, 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 the depiction. But we know that actually when Jesus was on that cross, he was on his throne. That was his throne. Amen? He looked into an unbelieving world. And what do we see? Do we see a weak Jesus on the cross or do we see a Jesus on the throne doing the work of the cross, which is much more important than sitting in heaven on the throne when it comes to us personally, whether we are saved or not. Now, the world expects God to be on the throne in heaven, but they don't see the throne of the cross as being a place of power, a place of establishment, but it certainly was. While crushing death, destroying my sins was he enthroned on the cross yeah no greater works might he do to the lost unbeliever it's weakness it's what else pastor furby foolishness but to christians god in all of his glory and power was doing it for me he was doing what i could not do he did what all humanity could not do for me. No president, no philosopher, no religious leader. An angel could not do it for me. No man could have died for my sins. Do we embrace that weakness? Understanding it's only a veil? Okay, are we clearing our ears here? Give it a I don't have a different microphone. Are these mics turned off? Yeah, they're all off, aren't they? Okay. If I were ever to give in to the torture and deny Jesus, which I could presumably, that could happen. If someone got a hold of me, it, you know, the truth of the matter is it's not like on TV. It just isn't. When a person gets tortured, they may hold out for an hour, a day, maybe a week, maybe even a month, but in the end, usually they either die or they give up the info. Or they recant, or they will say something that they don't believe. Well, if I were tortured by the Taliban or ISIS or whatever, and, and then I came to a place of saying, yes, there's no Jesus, well, I'd be sinning, I'd be lying. Because it wouldn't be the truth. Amen? Because the truth is, in his weakness, he forgave. He laid down his life that he would take it up again by the power of God. And that is his power. And he could do it over and over and over again. Jesus could die and come alive and die and come alive, die and come alive over and over again. That's the power that he has. The power came from where? From the Father. Jesus said, from my Father. There is nothing like the Bible in all the world. There's nothing like this depiction. He is risen, risen indeed. The Bible has, is historically accurate, prophetically accurate, scientifically consistent, culturally relevant throughout all cultures, correct archaeologically, and theology is correct but you remove the resurrection and you destroy everything. You destroy the whole deal. 
Amen? You see, Jesus is in you, and we have power to, thirdly, endure. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Number three, Jesus gives us the power to endure. Yes, we are weak, but he is strong. He's strong enough to let us engage He's strong enough for us to establish the truth and to endure the truth. If he didn't rise from the dead, we are dead in the water face down. And Paul tells them, know this, this will be a three strikes deal. Three strikes, you're out. I'm coming to see you again. Hopefully, you'll get the message before I get there. If you're not, if you're not ready, I'm going to have to deal with you severely. Verses 3 and 4, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me who is not weak toward you but mighty in you, for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Now when Jesus was crucified, they thought he was weak. But three days later, he rose again. And so too, Paul says, you look at us as weak, but when we come back, you'll see his power flowing through us, rising up in us. Now, why is he being so stern? Because this is what it took to get these people to understand that they were being duped, sucked in by false teachers. You see, the devil dupes you all the time into rationalizing your sin away, into thinking, well, you know what? It's not the Holy Spirit. It's okay to have the distilled spirits to excess. I fill myself up with a distilled spirit. It's okay for me to not do this because I can rationalize why I'm not. It's okay to me to go and look at certain things on the internet. That's okay because, you know, I've got all these, you know, John F. JFK, Kennedy, look what he did. You know, he did these things because of the stress of his life. I've heard Someone actually told me that one time. Oh, you know, Kennedy, he was a womanizer, but, you know, he was president, and he had all these stresses and everything. This was a multimillionaire in Beverly Hills sitting in his library talking with him, discussing Christianity. He was Jewish, and he's telling me this. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. What does that mean? Does that mean just whether you believe Jesus? No. It means, do you follow Jesus? Do you live like Jesus lives within you? Or are there strongholds in your life? Paul's saying, you're criticizing us. You're finding fault with us. But he says, but here's what you should do. Examine yourself. Right now, when you're reading my letter, Stop and examine yourself and test yourself. The implication, sobering, sobering. There can be those who come to church week after week, month after month, after decade, who are not even saved. Never mind not examining and testing. How do you know? Well, You examine yourself before the Lord. You test. Amen? 2 Corinthians 13, 5, part B. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? It's not a matter of religion. It's not a question of theology, but of intimacy. It's not knowing about Jesus intellectually, but knowing him personally. But I trust that you will know, verse 6, that we are not disqualified. Now I pray to God that you do no evil. Not that we should appear to prove, but that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified. Look at us and see how Christ lives in us, how he's given guidance to us. And even if you don't buy our ministry, you may not like this. You may not like it. You know what? We're reaching out to the farther reaches 
of, of, of Jerusalem right now. And you may say, hey, we, you're needed in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's going through all kinds of bad things and disbursement and whatnot. And, and Paul, you know, come to Jerusalem. Why are you in Corinth to begin with? But even if you don't buy what you're, we're doing, we still hope you'll do what's right. For we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. If you're doing good, even though we're going through hard times, we rejoice. And this also, we pray in verse 9, that you may be made complete. Made complete. Now this is heavy. Complete. In other translations, it's the word perfect, that you may make, be made perfect. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong, and this also we pray that you may be made perfect, complete. That means take those things in your life that don't belong there and get rid of them. Deal with them. Examine yourself. Test yourself. If you're after somebody, are you using two or three witnesses? If not, zip it. Don't talk about people. That's gossip. If you haven't gone to them. And even then, if you've gone to them, then you take one other person. You don't go tell it to, you know, on the mountain to all that can hear. The tendency of many would be to say, well, here, I hope they get judged, these Corinthians. You know, I hope that they just crash and burn and are trashed and, and lose everything they have and, and you know, get broken and, and busted up and, and, and then they can get the message when they get so low that they can only but look and then they'll examine and test. That might be the tendency of the flesh, but not Paul. He says, I hope things will be perfect for you, that you'll be complete, that you'll have it, that you'll be there. That's what I wish upon you. And to prove it, that I really want maturity, that you'll do excellently. These are the things I want for you. To prove it, the way that I have this kind of heart for this kind of people in this kind of church is because I pray for them continually. If you have bad feelings towards someone in your life, if you're holding an ought against someone, and maybe you have done Matthew 18. Maybe you've had the two or three witnesses and you've gone through that process and you still have it. You know what I do? I'll take a picture and tack it on the wall of that person. Oh yeah, Pastor, I do the same thing and I put that, that push pin right through the, between their eyes. <laughs> no, no. What you do is you put the picture up where you see it every day and you pray for them. And you know when you take the picture down? When? When you no longer have any ill, hostile, unforgiving, bad feelings towards that person. That's when you take it down. But you know what happens when that happens? It stays up. Because, you, you, yeah, I'm going to keep praying for them. Why should I stop? It's working. It worked. Yeah. And so, you know, don't break what's not broken. Or don't fix what's not broken. When you want to see someone get wiped out because they've done you wrong, because they've hurt you, insulted you, pray God's blessing upon his or her life. When you pray for the people who irritate you, your heart changes towards them. Oh, they may be changed in the process. You may be changed in the process. But whether it happens or not, you will be changed, for one cannot be angry, hostile, or mad at those who they consistently pray for. It's almost impossible. Exactly. When you pray for people, you find your own heart desiring their perfection, their completeness. You want the best for them. Verse 10, Therefore I write these things, being absent, I'm not here, not there with you, but I am in spirit. Thus being present, I should use sharpness. I don't want to come and have to hammer on you. I don't want to have to come and lay heavy conviction on you according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. I want to be able to come and, and be nice 
I want to edify it. I want to encourage it. I don't want to knock you down. I don't want to credit point little things. Oh, look at that. Look, look, what, he, look what she did. Oh, 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 look what he did. Oh, isn't that terrible? No. I want to come and say, hey, man, did a great job. Yeah, man. You know, I'm glad to see there's some growth in you Corinthians since the second time I've been here. Yeah, man. You know, Simon over there, man, he was just out of control. He was just sinning and doing all this stuff. He must have read the, the first Corinthian letter and read most of the second because now he's grown. Verses 11 through 14. Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Now, when he died for our sin, he paid the price for every mistake we've made. Thus, it's through him and him alone that we can be complete, perfect by being perfectly forgiven. Be of good comfort. Look how he ends this. Be of good comfort. Now, he said some harsh stuff. He said some hard things. He's questioned their faith. He's told them that they're just, you know, wacko and that they're, they're, they've got bad people among them. Wolves and all kinds of things. False teachers. First Corinthians, second Corinthians, man, he's hammered and hammered and hammered. But now, I'm writing these things to you that you might make corrections now, but then be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Be in unity. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be what? With you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. You've got to be careful about that nowadays. We've had problems here in the past. We had a couple of guys that came in. I had to throw, personally throw them out of the church because they were just trying this holy kiss thing on, on the sisters. And it wasn't godly whatsoever. And the sisters would come and complain. And I went to them, and you know what? I didn't take another witness after two or three complained, that was enough. I said, you two are out of here. I asked them to repent. Didn't have one conversation. Had more than one conversation with them. They kept doing it. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And so we come to the end of this second Corinthian letter a beautiful and heartwarming ending to what was sometimes a necessarily, out of necessity, brutal and heart-rending epistle. And his closing statements begin with simple and solid exhortations. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. I'm kind of glad we're out of Corinthians, to be honest with you. I'm going to be transparent. You're going to pick a book that's like a vacation for the next book. And he, re and he shares that wonderful result that if they do these things, the God of love and peace will be with them. This morning, he is with us. We're going to have communion, a reminder of the fact that he is in us. He is with us. Which is absolutely amazing incredibly amazing that God Almighty who created all the universe would come down to be within us not tied around our neck not forcing himself upon us but with us just astounding, awesome, incredible. And Lord God, we come before you this day. And Father, this passage is so appropriate to having communion with you. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, let us come before you because this passage is appropriate on so many levels, so relevant on so many levels. And one level is that communion is about examining ourselves. 
testing ourselves. We know the Bible says to be careful about taking communion, and it's become a ritual, it's become a tradition in the church, and, and there's not too much about the being careful part of, of taking communion that's left in our culture, our church culture in this day and age. Though some places, when I went to the Orthodox Church in L.A., they told me, don't take communion. You're not an Orthodox Christian. Some places, they get crazy about it. But and for the most part, we've come to think, well, it's our right. We're entitled to communion. The entitlement mentality that prevails our society. Well, we're not. Completely entitled. Yes, we are entitled. Jesus died on the cross for us. And he told us, he commanded, he demanded that we would commemorate, that we would remember what he did on the cross. And that's what communion is all about. But also, we're told to examine ourselves before we partake of it, to make sure there's no unforgiveness towards someone in our hearts. And if there is, that we should not even partake. And so, Lord, we come before you and we examine our hearts for all things, Lord. Because we are human. We sin. We're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And, Father God, we come and once a month, Officially, we come before you, examining ourselves, putting ourselves at the foot of the cross, laying those sins at the foot of the cross, and knowing that you died at, at, on that cross, it was a throne of its own. To the world, foolishness, if we were to tell someone, a lost person, well, the cross was actually the throne they might have trouble with that concept. But that's the truth. It's the place where you smashed, where you destroyed sin for eternity for those that might believe in the cross, believe in you, believe in resurrection. And Father, you did that by sending your son down from heaven to earth the Son returned to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to reside within us. And one day the Son will return for us and we'll be caught up. Harpazo, the Greek word, violently caught up, dramatically, quickly into heaven to be with you. And Father, we thank you that there is the mystery of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being within us, not just the Holy Spirit, because you can't divide them up that way. Yes, they are three persons, but they are in one. And they are in this one, this one that holds the communion cup and holds the bread, the unleavened bread that represents sin, sin crushed while you sat on the throne of the cross. And Father God, let us not be a people who, I don't want to use the word blaspheme, but people who just keep on walking through life in sin. Keep on doing the same thing over and over again. But Lord, that we would repent even if it's not of praying enough or examining ourselves and testing ourselves, that we would take seriously our sin because you died on the cross for it. And you hate it to this day. And it's, the Bible says it's like you have to go through it all again. Not that you do, but it's like it. And so we come with this piece of bread and we lift it up to you and we ask Lord that you would revitalize us rejuvenate us restore us we've examined ourselves we're crying out to you 
We're laying everything at the foot of the cross. And we're saying, Jesus, have your way with us. And as we partake, we know that throughout the ages, it wasn't long after the church was established, after it was birthed, that the seriousness of the elements was taken and, and that Jesus within us, and this is a symbol of us taking Jesus within us. Now the wafer and the cup does not turn to flesh and blood in our bodies, but it is a reminder it's a sober reminder that we examine ourselves, we test ourselves, we partake, and that you do reside within us. And you don't just sit in us like a cup of water, a glass of water, but you pour out from us and you wash us from within with that clean water, with the blood of the Lamb. Let's partake of the, of the cracker together, the piece of bread together. Thank you, Jesus, for having come from heaven. That was no small deal. It would be like, we go to heaven, we're having a wonderful life, living with you in your presence, no sin, and then someone says, go back down to earth. Wouldn't want to do it. Go live another lifetime. Oh, you have to go through that again? No, this one's going to be worse. Oh, no. Well, that's what it'd be like. You came down from heaven, from the glory of heaven, from the complete, perfect place to the nasty place for us and died a terrible death for us. You shed your blood for us. And Lord, you're here with us right now, within us, and here with us, communing with us, as Paul said, come together in unity, peace and comfort. Oh Lord, give us the peace, give us the comfort in our lives. Bless us, Lord, almighty God, this day. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Let's partake. Mm. If you need prayer, we prayed and prayed and prayed for for many. We prayed for Gary Panola. We got the praise report, no cancer. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Another friend of mine thought, my friend Davin, who I took a trip with recently, and he was told he might have sleep apnea and needed to go to the sleep lab. And I told his wife, no. I said, I always preface it with, I always clarify, I'm not a doctor, but he doesn't have sleep apnea. She goes, how do you know? I said, because we were, we were in the hotel when, on our last road trip and, and he snores you know, like a bear, but he does it consistently. He doesn't stop snoring and have silence, he just snores and snores and snores. That's not sleep apnea, that's just big time snoring. So she, they called and, yeah, hey, he doesn't have sleep apnea like you said. I said, yeah, I figured I'd be surprised if he did. But the Lord is good. We pray and people get healed. We pray for a little baby Tristan. Yeah, you know, sometimes it gets to be like, oh man, baby Tristan over and over, but we gotta keep praying without ceasing, fervently. If you have an ailment, come on up and I'll pray with you. If you have a need, ask someone you're sitting with to pray with you. But establish, endure, be able to come together and engage. Amen? Lord, thank you. I ask a blessing upon these people and myself knowing that you do bless us because you've blessed us so richly over so many years. God bless everybody. Amen. Go and tell someone God bless you out there. Here, you can do it here. Or when you go out this afternoon, 